forsaking the ordinance of their God. They ask me for just decisions. They delight in the nearness of God. Why have we fasted and you do not see? Why have we humbled ourselves and you do not know? Behold, on the day of your fast you find your desire and drive hard all your workers. Behold, you fast for contention and strife and to strike with a wicked fist. You do not fast like today to make your voice heard on high. Is it a fast like this which I choose, a day for a man to humble himself? Is it for bowing one's head like a reed, and for spreading out sackcloth and ashes as a bed? Will you call this a fast, even an acceptable day to the Lord? Is this not, verse 6, is this not the fast which I choose, to loosen the bonds of wickedness, to undo the bands of the yoke, and to let the oppressed go free and break every yoke? Is it not to divide your bread with the hungry, and bring the homeless poor into the house, when you see the naked to cover him, and not to hide yourself from your own flesh. Then your light will break out like the dawn, and your recovery will speedily spring forth, and your righteousness will go before you. The glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you remove the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness, and if you give yourself to the hungry, and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then your light will rise in darkness, and your gloom will become like midday. And the Lord will continually guide you, and satisfy your desire in scorched places, and give strength to your bones. And you will be like a watered garden, and like a spring of water, whose waters do not fail. Those from among you will rebuild the ancient ruins. You will raise up the age-old foundations, and you will be called the repairer of the breach the restorer of the streets in which to dwell. Let's pray. Oh, Father, what a beautiful passage you've given us this morning. What, a, uh, what amazing, wonderful promises there are laid out for us here, showing your willingness and desire to bless us. We pray that you will help us to, to hear what you're saying to us through this passage, that your spirit will work in our hearts, bring change, make us like Jesus, give us the power to obey. For your glory. Amen. Amen. So last week we did verses 1 to 5, and um, just to kind of recap the message from last week, first we saw that it's possible to be sincerely seeking God. These people that Isaiah was addressing here were sincerely seeking God, while at the same time committing really bad sins. They were sincerely seeking God while committing really bad sins, and so God was not hearing them. God re was refusing to listen to them or answer their prayers because they were committing sin. And so God, then we saw that God often uses other believers to show us our sinfulness. In the case of this passage, God's using Isaiah to try to awaken the people of Israel to the sins that are standing between them and God. One, three, third, good morning. That's okay. One brief uh, clarification is, it would be, you know, here's a diagram from last week. I didn't want, I, I came across, or could have come across in ways as saying that for us to have a relationship with, with God, that we have to have a preacher as kind of a mediator between us. And, and I don't want to give you that impression. We're not Catholics. We don't need a, uh, a vicar in between us and God. Um, there is one mediator between God and man. And who is it? Jesus Christ. That's right. Yes. Um, so it is possible, obviously, for us to... Um, <coughs> to hear from God just directly through his word. We don't have to hear it through a preacher. But God does sometimes use preachers because sometimes we're deaf to his word and we're just reading it ourselves. So sometimes God uses other Christians to um, awaken us. So this week, if we look at verses 6 to 12, Isaiah turns from confronting them about their sin to showing them what they should do instead. He's not just... Like a, a good counselor, since we had the counseling training in the last few months, a good counselor doesn't just show you the problem, doesn't just show you your sin, but he'll also show you how the solution, steps of repentance. We call them the put-offs and the put-ons, like in Ephesians and Colossians, where Paul tells us to put off these things and put on these things. So God, being the wonderful counselor, um, gives Isaiah instruction on how to guide Israel in fleshing out repentance, on what things to do instead of the evil that they were doing. So, look in your Bibles. I'm sorry I didn't get it all written out here. This is only verses 6 to uh, 10. But if you look in your Bibles at verses 6 to 12, and <coughs> we're going to pick up 
place to divide these verses in half. In other words, uh, kind of a, um, break it into two sections, two different paragraphs. Where would you put the division? Then. Let's see, which then are you looking at there? Either one. <laughs> okay, just, just, yeah, just find a, one place to divide the whole thing into two paragraphs. Mercy. Let's see. There is definitely a change of thought there, but keep reading and see if you see another one that's even more. Probably could be verse 3. Mm -hmm. Where in verse 3? <coughs> then you shall call the Lord Lord. Okay. Yeah, he didn't put up the handboard. <laughs> 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 oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Right. I said 58, she didn't know. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I said 58. There are all the other people coming in afterwards, right? Yeah, but the people came out. And, uh, um, you look at verses 6 to 12, and see if you can see. I'll break it down a little bit more. I'll give you a hint. The division point is in verse 9, but it's not the beginning of verse 9. Yes. 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 Okay. You will cry for him? Yes. If. It's the if. The, the if midway through verse 9 is kind of the dividing point in these verses. And, okay, now, but now let's look at the two sections we've put this into. First look at verses, this will kind of help you see where we're going here. Look at verses six through the first half of nine. Now if you're going to divide that into two sections, where would you put the division there? Six to nine? Mm-hmm. <coughs> see if I can find a follow that one here. Uh, let's see this is. Okay. Maybe eight, ten. Mine has two things, and at the beginning, then your light, and then, then your righteousness will go before you. <laughs> the, uh, the, how would you describe, okay, let's, this is, this is a, a dividing point in the first paragraph here. You didn't get as much as I, I missed the first part of nine there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, look at your Bibles. <laughs> then you will call. Yes. Um, yes, we will call. How would you describe this part here as <coughs> compared to this part here, including the part I left out? Um, <laughs> so what's the difference between this part and this part? What's the difference? Uh, one. What's the difference between verses 6 and 7 and verse 8 in the first half of 9? Well, I think verse 6 and 7 is asking a question. Okay. 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 Let's see. Let's see. Um, I'm trying to, I guess, maybe 8 through first part of 9 would be like the answer. Do you think you're going to? Well, God is telling, yeah, it's like from my perspective. But God is telling them what they didn't do. And yeah. then the verse and then the verse eight is in what the result will be if they mm -hmm. were if they were obeyed? Okay. No. Yeah, you're you're getting closer, Julie. Actually, um you could call this um result. <coughs> yeah, the results of uh, mm -hmm. Between the, somewhere between um, 
second half of 9 and the end of 12. Let's see if you see a similar breaking point there. Well, it's 10 and 10. Yep, then 10. That's right, so that's 10, second half of 10. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, what we could do is <coughs> solve this first section here, 6 and 7, and the first section of the second paragraph, we could call these conditions. In other words, these are things for them to do. If you do these, and then in the second part, a different color here. Then they work the onion. Yeah, promise. Promises. These are. Oh, I promise. Yeah. Okay, so we have conditions and promises. If you meet these conditions, then God says He will cause these promises to be. Okay, so you see, you see that now, kind of? Uh, mm -hmm. that? There's, there's two kind of similar paragraphs. He starts off with if, if, if you do these things, then I will do these things. If you do these things, then I will do these things. You see how that works? Okay. Now, take a look at the conditions sections and see if you can break the conditions, like in verses 6 and 7. See if you can think of two different types of conditions he's giving there. Yes, yes, that's right. Okay, 6 and 7. See if you can think of a way of breaking the 6 and 7 into two different kinds of conditions. Two different kinds of things he wants them to do. Free them and feed them. Hmm. Okay, actually, actually, that, that's not bad. Now what's um, free them, feed them, and house them? All right, that's true. <laughs> but um, there is a positive and a negative. He's kind of <coughs> there's removing bad things, um, stopping bad things, ending bad things, and then doing positive things for them. Um, like in verse 6, uh, to loosen the bonds of wickedness, undo the bands of the yoke, let the oppressed go free, break every yoke. Yeah, it's kind of undoing or removing negative things, right? Mm -hmm. Bad things. And then verse 7 is doing positive things. Yeah. Divide the <coughs> hungry, pour into the house, cover the naked, etc. Yeah. Okay, now do you see that down in, again in this section here, the last, the second half of verse 9 and the beginning of verse 10? Where do you, what do you see, which part is the kind of Removing negatives, and which part is the doing something good in that section? The first part, verse 9. Uh, Take away. I guess we'll get into the second part of verse 9. Right. Mm -hmm. Then turn on down. Right. Okay, so the, like the second half of 9 is kind of removing the negative things, the first part of 10 is doing positive things. Yeah. Okay, so you see. Can they hear you when you're talking? Can you hear me? I don't know. <laughs> no, in the your mom. Yeah, she can hear. Well, yeah, I've, got a, I've got a microphone on here. Mostly she can hear me. Oh, I see. Okay. But mom, no hands. <laughs> <laughs> the. Much uh, uh, mom, no teeth. <laughs> <laughs> so, I just I wanted to kind of break down this so that it, because otherwise it just seems like one big long passage that goes on. So I wanted to kind of show you the structure of it so you can see that there is a sequence here. He's doing, um, he's, and if we had time, you could even compare and contrast the two paragraphs and there's slight differences <coughs> and try to get nuances from that. But what, do, do you remember what the problems were that the people were experiencing in verses one to five? And do you see any way that the promises that God's giving them tie in to the problems that they were experiencing. I guess one through five is, or, well, I guess one through five is them asking God, or yes, telling God, no, we're doing this, we're doing this, and this. And then God is saying, well, these are the conditions that you have to meet, and then they this what all this Okay, that's a good point. So they were doing, what they thought was going to get God's attention, and God's saying, no, no, that's not going to work. To, to get my attention, you need to do this set of conditions instead, right? Okay. And then what, what about the promises? What was it that they were wanting from God? <coughs> Why are you talking one and five? In verses one to five, yeah. What was it they were... Yeah. You can try 
kind of see it, especially in uh, verse 2, what they were wanting from God. Yeah, they were seeking what? Mm -hmm. They wanted to know his ways. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. They wanted justice. Good, yep. Mm -hmm. Wanted the nearness of God. Uh, mm -hmm. Yep, they wanted God to accept him. The fasting. And so the promises that he's giving them here tie in back into that because he's saying, you know, like they were calling, they were calling on God, they were praying, but he was not answering. And so here in verse uh, um, 9, he says, Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry and he will say, Here I am. Um, so in, in contrast to what they were experiencing as they were sinning, um, or they were calling and God was not answering, here God comes, if you do this, then I will answer. And they were wanting guidance, they weren't getting it. In in verse um, verse eleven, and the Lord will continually guide you. So they were wanting guidance and not getting it. And so God's saying, if you do this, then I will guide you. So it's kind of like God saying to them, in, in essence, if you want an intimate relationship with me, you know, dump the sackcloth and go help your impoverished countrymen that you've been oppressing. And I'll be closer to you then than you ever dreamed to ask. The, and the irony stands out even more clearly in Hebrew, that this was written in originally. Um, if you look at verse 3, uh, verse three. yes, uh, how does your verse 3 read, the first half of verse 3? Peggy, what do you have there? Why have we fasted? Mm -hmm. They say, and you have not seen it. Mm -hmm. Keep going. Why have you humbled yourselves and you have not noticed? Okay. Does yeah. anybody have a different translation there? You know, why? Yeah, what does that say? Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen? Why have we afflicted our soul? Good. You take no notice. Perfect. That's actually a more literal translation. The, in Hebrew, why have we afflicted our soul? Um, it's, uh, the word for afflicted is ana. I'm probably mispronouncing it. And the word for soul what is nefesh. Nancy? 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 That's, in, I mean, Judy. Judy, how do you <laughs> say it? She's asleep. No, I'm not asleep either. I'm trying. Yeah. My Bible is... She has a king change. No, I don't. I switch to woman's devotion. Okay. What does it say in verse 3? Right? Okay. <clears throat> it just says, The ox knows his master, the donkey his owner's manger. But Israel does not know. <clears throat> My people do not understand. It's a wrong chapter. Says. It's a different chapter. You're in a different chapter. Well, no wonder it doesn't say this. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, you said Isaiah. Yeah, that's right. 58. Yeah, 58. I'm sorry, yeah. I keep looking and looking. I'm thinking, I don't need another book. <laughs> All right. Well, let's see. Yeah. Um, so, anyway, so the point I'm trying to make is it's, they were afflicting their souls. Okay, as it can. And then <coughs> down in verse uh, 10, in Hebrew, it's the same, the same words in the Hebrew. If you give yourself to the hungry, literally, it's if you give your soul, your nefesh. To the hungry, and satisfy, and satisfy the soul, nefesh of the afflicted. Then your light will rise in darkness, and your gloom will become like midday. So back in verse three, they were afflicting their own souls through fasting, trying to get God's attention, and God's saying, "No, no, don't, don't, you know, that's not going to work. But if you go give your soul to the hungry, if you go meet someone else's need," um, John Piper says it this way. So God comes to them and says, The fast that I choose is not that you religiously make yourselves hungry and afflicted, but that you make the poor less hungry and afflicted. If you want to fight sin by, putting, by taking your bread away from your own mouth, then put it into the mouth of the poor. Then we will really see if you are fasting for righteousness' sake. Does that make sense? So it's not just, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, asceticism, not just, you know, denying yourself things trying to get God's attention that way, but actually being generous, giving. Um, and then in verse 11, 
that same word is used again, the Lord will uh, continually guide you and satisfy your desire, your soul, your nefesh in scorched places. So he's saying, if you give your soul, yourself, your, your life, your essence to other people, then God will satisfy your soul. Sometimes we, we you know, have the idea, you know, okay, God, you know, fill me up. <coughs> I really just want to experience you. Fill me up with your joy and your peace, and then I'll go minister to people around me, right? And in, in, in this passage, God's kind of saying, pour everything you have out, and then I'll refill you. I'll make you a fountain. We have the idea we want to get filled up first, and then we'll go drip a few things on other people. But God's saying, just go dump everything you have out on other people. Give without holding back, and I'll fill you. I'll, I will continue. That makes leave. sense, huh? What's that? That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Now, take a look at the promises um, that he's given. Let's just look at the, all the promises he's dumped out here. Um, Number eight. Starting in verse eight, yeah. Um, and we'll just go slowly. Think about what the, there's like a problem, or a, a, a negative situation implied by, and sometimes actually stated, but at least implied in each of these. Like when you think, then your light will break out like the dawn. What does that kind of imply the situation is at that time. Very dark. Yep, there's darkness. But God's been saying, in the middle of darkness, your light's going to break out. Okay, next section. Your recovery will speedily spring forth. What does that imply? They talk about physical healing. What do you think? Yeah. Um, it's <laughs> it's uh, it sure looks like it, doesn't it? But the the. Uh, it doesn't get specific, but what would be the negative uh, situation that this promise would be in the middle of? There would be some kind of an illness or sickness of some sort, right? Okay. Um, next section, your righteousness will go before you. What would be the problem that that promise would be meant to meet? You get righteousness. Saved. Saved, yeah, okay. It could be just referring to getting saved, getting right, Christ's righteousness imputed to us, yeah. or our righteousness um, protecting us. Um, the glory of the Lord being under <coughs> guard implies that we have enemies that we need guarding from, doesn't it? Um, what about then you will call and the Lord will answer? What does that imply as a problem? You're working in the answer from the Lord. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you're in the middle of some kind of situation where you're afraid or you, you, you're confused or whatever, like you will cry and he will say, here I am, that, that um, you, you feel maybe, uh, alone or uh, uncertain what to do. Uh, okay, now jumping down to verse 10, the second half of verse 10, then your light will rise in darkness, there's that darkness, it actually says at this time, your gloom is the problem, will become like midday, and the Lord will continually guide you, again, there's that guidance, implying that we need guidance, and that there are situations that come along that confuse or perplex us. Um, the next section, satisfy your <coughs> your soul, your desire in scorched places. So, scorched places would be the, the, the negative situation, right? Be in the middle of a <coughs> really dry, barren situation, but God will satisfy your soul there. Now, is that just talking about literally, you know, going out in the middle of the desert here? Spiritual. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, and so, and give strength to your bones, uh, which implies weakness. You'll be a water garden like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Again, does that mean you're not going to get physically thirsty? No, but it means it's, it's uh, spiritually your soul. So, with uh, verse 8, where it says your recovery will speedily spring forth, and verse 11, giving strength to your bones. I don't know that we can necessarily say that you know God's always going to reverse your osteoporosis if you do this, but he might. And <laughs> it, is it talking about <coughs> spiritually? Is it talking about physically? It doesn't really specify. And I think that... Yeah, but what does it mean? You can get some views from a different... That it, to me, it's not too important how God fulfills these, but he will fulfill them. The more important thing for me is am I meeting the conditions that he lays down to be in the place that uh, God will bless. Um, okay, water garden in the middle of drought, and then verse 12, 
those from among you will rebuild the ancient ruins. So there's been some kind of devastation, but um, your descendants are going to rebuild them, raise up the age-old foundations. The repair of the breach, so there's been, the breach is like they had walls around cities, and if an enemy invaded, they would knock down part of the wall and make a big opening so that the city was without protection, and you'll be, because um, one of the promises is that you'll be one who repairs the holes in the walls and the restorer of the streets in which to dwell. Um, so here's where I'm trying to go with all that. Do these problems, do these, excuse me, do these promises mean that we will never encounter problems if we fulfill the conditions for these promises? Will we never encounter problems? No. What he's saying is that we will have problems, but God's presence and provision will be there for you in the middle of them, right? God will say, yes. So it's like it has you back. Uh, Eugene, the Lord will be your rear guard mm -hmm. you back. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's a good person to have on your back, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, the, uh, now there's a danger here that, that we can think of, okay, this is a list of things for me to, to just go out and do. This is like my job description to go get blessings from God, to get uh, salvation. We, we don't want to turn this into some kind of a a works righteousness thing. John Piper says it helpfully here. Don't make the mistake of thinking this is a job description that God has given his people to show them how to earn wages from him. What God calls the people to do is not a job description, but a doctor's prescription. It's not a job description, but a doctor's prescription. You can see that in verse 8 where it says that if you act this way, if you follow the doctor's prescription of fasting, your recovery, your healing will speedily spring forth. If you trust the doctor and show this by obeying his instructions, you will get well. So don't think that you're going to earn anything from God. Trust his sovereign grace, follow his prescription, and you will be mightily blessed. But it will never occur to you to think that you've earned or merited anything. That's what John Piper had to say. So does that help a little bit? You're not earning anything from God. This is just blessings that, that um, come when you follow his prescription. Well, when do we earn anything from God? What's that? What do you mean by earning? anything from God. Um, in other words, if you think like we're giving something to God and then he's obligated to give us something back. Putting ten dollars in the pot and expecting a hundred back. Yeah. That's a good deal. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good deal. And here's, here's what Charles Spurgeon said in describing the same passage to, to help balance it out again. So, though salvation is of divine grace, the happiness of the Christian does depend on his obedience. Our ultimate safety is of sovereign grace. No man shall exceed me in the plain declaration that in this respect works of any sort cannot touch our salvation. We are saved upon another footing than that of our personal graces. In other words, we're saved because of Jesus' righteousness, Jesus' perfection, not our own. But it is quite as plainly the teaching of the Holy Scripture that answers to prayer, the enjoyment of the presence of God, and a healthy state of spirit are very much dependent on our cautious walking and our holy obedience to the divine will. There is an if here. And should any of us neglect and despise it, and fancy that we can still have our souls like watered gardens, it will not be long before we shall find out our mistake. Okay, so am I confusing you, or is that making sense? Putting you to sleep? Probably doing a little bit. The, uh, so there is, uh, these are real conditions and real promises, but our salvation does not hinge on us fulfilling these. These are fruits of our salvation, ultimately. All these things <coughs> fruits that flow from God working in us by the Holy Spirit as we come to Jesus in repentance and trust. So now, I, I hope that these promises seem appealing to you. I hope that as you look at these, you're like, wow, I would really like to see these carried out fully in my life. So has there ever been a time in your life when you can think of when one of these has come true for you? these promises, uh, a situation has arisen and the promise came true for you. I know you cannot give God. Have you ever seen that happen? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And you've got to balance all this against Job too, don't you? Yeah. And in verse 11, um, we know that he will guide us. Ew. And he would um, satisfy this. Let's see, the more you're satisfied, the more God is glorified. Mm -hmm. That's right. 
Um, like just a simple example, sometimes I go down and, and teach a Bible study for some guys that are mentally handicapped. Um, and I think usually most of it goes over their heads. Um, but I, 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 I go down there like, ah, i got to do this again. And I'm kind of having a bad attitude. You know, and these guys never get anything. And I go down there and I wind up just basically preaching to myself for an hour. I think, and I come back like, oh, that was good. I needed that. Lord, thank you. <laughs> it's, so it's kind of, it's kind of a, that's an example. Where did you go? The Olive Branch. Um, oh, you go there? Yes. Yeah. <coughs> Where do you teach them from? Any book? Usually I'll take a story from the Bible because it, it's easier for them to kind of get a story and stuff. Take uh -huh. a story and, and they love Daniel. They don't yeah, care they, what he teaches. They, they, they love him. That's they, the key. <laughs> if I drive up in the car, oh, Dan, you. <laughs> they love Daniel. Anyways, so yeah. how many do you have? Uh, usually like 11 or 12. Oh, oh that's great. Yeah. That's um, a good church, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, uh, the point I was trying to get at is, you know, there I'm, I'm kind of giving myself to the hungry or needy in some way, and, but and then God refilling me, uh, um, refreshing me in the middle of that. And have any of you experienced something like that? Or you know, you know, I remember when I was having my valve replacement <clears throat> the night before surgery, I just said, Lord, you made me your sovereign. It's your will that I come see you, then I guess I come see you for whatever you decide. Mm -hmm. And I have never experienced a peace in my life and security mm -hmm. of going into surgery. I don't think any patient has ever had that. They can't unless they know the Lord. It was a wonderful feeling. And probably others of you can relate to that, those kind of situations where you're in the middle of some crisis where, okay, God, it's all you now, and, and God comes through, right? And over and over. Yes. So now, as we look at the conditions here, um, what would it look for, like for us today to obey these verses? What do you think? I mean... Is this just a, you know, kind of telling us we should all go down and volunteer? No, if you work at Batches, you treat everybody with kindness and mercy. We <laughs> 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 the same in our businesses, too, you know. Okay. Um, but Did you get that, baby? Start to be nice. You're always nice. So, I mean, is this passage calling us to you? Should we, is this passage saying that we should all go down and volunteer at Old Town Mission? Mm -hmm. well, no. We need to start here in the church. Okay. okay. <coughs> where, do you, where do you kind of see that in this passage? To start here in the fire Christ. Mm -hmm. Let me see. It's a little bit tricky, but once I show you, you'll be like, oh, yeah. Okay. Give us a hint. Uh, it's in verse 7. That's right. If you come, mm -hmm. come on Tuesday night, you can divide your bread with the hungry. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Right? <laughs> There's truth to that, actually. You're coming Tuesday night. It's Tuesday night this month. Here. Yeah, come Tuesday night. You don't have to bring any food, just come meet. Not hide yourself from your own flesh. Very good, very good. Okay, so. Good job. Bring your sister. Not hide yourself from your own flesh. I'm assuming that means you're a good Christian. Uh, yeah, I mean, literally, it's like your own body. You know, I mean, same thing. From your own body. And so, who is who are fellow body members with us? body of Christ, right? The, in, in, in the context here, he's talking about the covenant community that the other Israelite people that were there in, in the community with them. Uh, don't hide yourself. They were, you know, there's, there were the rich people who, because of their riches, were able to live kind of separate without having to be, you know, out there amongst the, the neediness in the community around them. And he's saying, okay, get out there and see the neediness in your own community. But the community for Israel was not, it was like it would be like the, all of us in the church all living in the same town, you know, having a church town, kind of, instead of just... We got a story. There's a lady in India that got polio when she was young, and she's about this tall. She just kind of sits, and she... The people that in other house churches found her and led her to the Lord, and they started bringing her to the... She joined the class of pastors that were getting trained. So... She couldn't do anything but pray at home and be part of the class. So in the last six months, she's had over 500 Hindus come to her home 
and talk to her because she prayed for them, prayed for them, loved them. And she also graduated. I couldn't believe this little lady, you know, <coughs> about this tall. That's it. And but God is using her. How old is she? How old is she? Uh-huh. She was young. She's probably under 30. Wow. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. No, no, she's young, but she's given her life to the Lord and to prayer. Here's another passage. Here's another passage that kind of shows about hiding yourself from your own flesh, being um, related to your covenant family. Um, Deuteronomy 22. I'll just read this to you. Being in Deuteronomy 22, you shall not see your brother's ox or his sheep going straight and hide yourself from them. You shall certainly bring them back to your brother. Um, Jumping down to verse 4. You shall not see your brother's donkey or his ox fall down along the road and hide yourself. And you surely help him lift them up again. So uh, the idea of hiding yourself from your own flesh means you know, just kind of living in isolation and ignorance, deliberate ignorance of the needs uh, in the covenant community around you. What verse? That was that I just read was Deuteronomy 22, verses 1 and 4. I read it later, but... That, again, well, that, that came out better and more accurately in the New King James, actually. So if you read it in the New King James later. Um, but all that to say, there is a priority. Not that we shouldn't help unsaved people. Not that we shouldn't you know, help Old Town Mission or whatever. But there's a priority in Scripture for helping members of the body of Christ. Um, do good to all men, especially those who are of the household of faith. Paul said in Galatians 6. And, you know, by this will all men know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Yeah, it's um, just like um, if you were to <coughs> be really nice to the neighbor kids, but not treat your own kids so well, that would not uh, be a good testimony. And the same way, if you, if we are really loving to non-Christians but ignore the needs of other Christians, it's a bad testimony and um, brings shame to the gospel. Now, let's skip that. There are two dangers that we can face in looking at this passage. Um, the first danger would be just kind of spiritualizing this passage, saying, you know, um, we should flee free slaves from sin, and we should give people the bread of life with Jesus. Um, we should give people the clothes of righteousness um, and, and invite them to the home of God in heaven, and just kind of, you can, you can take it and spiritualize it that way. And just, um, uh, and the danger there is because Isaiah is actually talking about real physical needs, not just spiritual ones. So we might, if we're not careful, we might actually twist this passage into an excuse to meet spiritual needs while ignoring physical. You know, God bless you, go home, have a great day, God bless you, be warm and filled while they're going hungry or whatever. But uh, the other danger of just reading this passage only in the immediate physical sense, physical needs, we, we, could, we might come at this and say, you know, yeah, this doesn't apply to me. We just we don't have any naked, starving slaves in our church. So, you know, apply to them, but it doesn't apply to me. Or, you know, I haven't been treating my workers unfairly, so this passage doesn't apply to me. We could wind up focusing just on physical needs and ignore spiritual needs. So, how should we apply this passage biblically? We can interpret it correctly in the context of the original situation, and then from that interpretation, draw principles that do apply to us today. You know, yes, we don't have um, you know, naked, starving slaves in our church. But there are principles that apply very much to us today. As we know, all scripture is profitable, right? For for teaching, and what else? For proving mm-hmm. and training. Training righteousness. Proof to perfection and training righteousness. Yeah. Show us what we're doing and wrong. Yeah. Show us what we're doing wrong, what we should be doing instead, and help us walk that way, right? So, we can also examine the New Testament church for clues on how they applied this passage. <clears throat> so looking at this passage in Isaiah 58, what parts of it seem like it's talking more about physical needs and which parts seem like maybe more spiritual problems being addressed? I think we're going to the seven. Well, physical needs, seven. Mm-hmm. Okay. The freeing, the feeding, and the 
Faith and joy is the spiritual. Those are the promises there, actually. Oh. But um, the second half of verse 9, that is more spiritual. They're moving, you know, pointing at a finger and speaking wickedness. That's more oh. of a spiritual problem, yeah? It's the words and the attitudes. <clears throat> Literally, it, uh, it's the sending forth of the finger. John Piper says it's probably actually has more like to do with giving people the finger than, than even going like this. It's probably more like giving them the <laughs> finger. And uh, the, the Hebrew equivalent of that. <laughs> and... Uh, What about verse 10? Would you describe which parts of that seem more physical, which parts seem more spiritual there? What's the first part of verse 10? I would say physical. What is, how does it translate that in your version there, Julie? And if you spend yourselves in the behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed. Okay. And the second part of 10 is spiritual. Uh, yeah, that, that's a uh, promise that's coming yeah, more the part. But <coughs> actually, in the Hebrew, again, the first part of 10 is if you give your soul to the hungry and satisfy the soul of yeah, the hungry. Yeah, my hungry. soul, which okay. makes it more spiritual. Yeah, which makes it sound more spiritual, or more, at least, because soul has the idea of the complete person, not just their body, but the, the complete person. Um, and you can read Hebrew? Uh, no, I just <laughs> use the tools on the computer. Ah, yeah. well, you missed your chance to say yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and also <coughs> another aspect we see here of, of that it's more than just physical needs being met is because he's, if you notice all throughout this, even in verses 6 and 7, he's calling for personal involvement. Um, divide, divide your bread. You know, that's, you know, you got a piece of bread, you know, cut it in half and give it half to the guy with you there. That's, that's very, it's not just, you know, not just mailing a check off to World Vision or whatever, you know, it's, this is very, um, very personal. Uh, bring the poor into the house. You know, that's, that's wow. That's, that's pretty connected. And, um, actually, clothe the naked. Can you see the naked? Clothe them, not to hide yourself. You know, this isn't. So the need was just a purely material need, need that God was calling us to meet. He wouldn't really care. You know, the send in the check might be more efficient, but God wants more than just physical needs met. He wants spiritual things to happen also. And so he's calling for personal um, involvement. There was, if you remember, the original problem back in verses 1 to 5, they were driving their workers too hard, they were pressing their workers, and they were striking with a wicked fist. Those are kind of physical things that needed to end. But there was also contention and strife going on. There was anger, there were heart issues going on. And so these things that he's calling them to do instead, in verses 6 to 12, address not only the, the physical violence and oppression going on, but also the spiritual uh, anger strife in their hearts, the speaking of wickedness, but giving them the finger. Um, and God calls them to give themselves, not just give food and, and um, clothing and housing, but to give yourself, give, your, give yourself, give your soul to the hungry, verse 10. And we see in the New Testament church, we see echoes of both of aspects of this as well. We see, um, well, what, in the New Testament church, what examples do we see of giving physical assistance? In the church giving physical assistance to people? In the New, What's that? New Testament? In the New Testament church, mm-hmm. Caring for widows? Yeah, great, caring for widows, what else? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This is jail. What's that? Prison. Okay. Visiting them in the prison. Yeah. Remember those who are in bonds, just being down with them? Sure. Christians in jail. Um, there was, you guys are doing great, um, the, um, there was the church in Jerusalem that Paul took up an offering for from some of the other churches that were more prosperous during the persecution. I know, I know. Yeah, the Corinthians, um, the Philippians, and, uh, and, and the uh, Romans. That's not, that's not that. and, uh, he brought a donation to them, but they, the, the, the Thessalonians did give. I'm, getting mixed up. I'm not sure about that, but yes, the uh, there was there was physical uh, uh, needs being met. First John, of course, says, "Whoever has the world's good and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him?" So it's very clear that we are to meet physical needs for each other, not just spiritual needs. But and then, of course, what would be there's plenty of examples of this, but what would be examples in the New Testament of meeting some believers' spiritual needs? In the New Testament. Mm-hmm. Nicodemus. Okay. 
but um, by somebody in the church later on. I'm not sure if Jesus was meeting a spiritual need for Nicodemus, but. Um, well, Paul wrote, you know, letters of support. Yeah, yeah, he was edifying them. And what about did he ever tell believers to encourage each other and build each other up spiritually? In Ephesians, um, mm-hmm. right? Okay. Ephesians 4, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up. As fits the occasion, they may give grace to those who hear. And so, and so there was there was plenty of mention uh, in the New Testament that we were to encourage each other spiritually. But here's where I'm trying to go with this: Is it really all that easy to separate meeting physical needs and spiritual needs? Like, think about when you when you offer hospitality to somebody: Is that meeting a physical need or a spiritual need? Apparently both. Well, mm-hmm. it all depends on your mindset. Mm-hmm. You know, you can offer somebody. Hospitality, but you're not in the mindset of hoping to glorify God with that. Mm-hmm. But if you try to think about it beforehand and pray about it beforehand mm-hmm. and say, God, please remind me, then you're not glorifying God. Like Peter tells us, you know, be hospitable to one another without complaint. You see, there are both aspects of As it. As a hostess, mm-hmm. you said, how can we meet the physical and the spiritual too? No, I, I'm saying, which. Um, when you, when you are a hostess, when you do offer hospitality to people, is that a spiritual need you're meeting or a physical need? And, and Susanna is right, it, it can be both. And Michael, Michael had it there as well. It can be both because when we, when we invite someone into our home, we have opportunity to bless them spiritually and bless them physically, right? So it, sometimes it's not all that easy to separate the two. Like, oh, now I'm going to do a physical blessing to somebody, now I'm going to do a spiritual blessing. Sometimes it's also mixed up together that you can't really separate it. Well, I get to to worry about the physical needs, mm-hmm. and you know, and I should just. I realize that we can meet spiritual needs too. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm going to be more aware of that. Mary. Martha, Martha, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I'm a Martha, yeah. Well, I'm a I'm a Mary too. Yeah, amen. Sometimes. Now think about take a minute think about the most enjoyable meal you've ever had. Try to think about that. Yeah. <laughs> There will be snacks. There will be snacks soon. Gee, I like my, I like my chicken. Oh yeah, <laughs> Bur- and your burrito would be great too. Chicken burrito. Oh, yeah. mm. I'm not talking just about your favorite. Yeah, I'm really getting. I'm not talking about your favorite food per se, but I'm talking about the, the most enjoyable meal you've eaten. Oh, the whole meal. The, with you know, think about where you were, who you were with, the experience. Oh, I think I think it was probably with our mentors. Mm. There was a period when we both lived within a few blocks of each other, mm-hmm. and we would go over there about once a week, I think it was. And uh, as that's kids. when, pardon? As kids. As kids? Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's what it was. And we learned how you raise a family and how you have a marriage mm-hmm. because of going over there. And, and the, the meal that comes to mind is she served hot dogs one night. <laughs> Perfect. That's, that's yeah. exactly the kind of illustration I want. Yeah. This is this not what is just mm-hmm. not what you mean is for us. It's mm-hmm. not. Yeah. Yes. So they were meeting a physical need, but there was a spiritual thing taking place there that was much more meaningful in the middle of that. And so, um, yeah. Life changing yes. to the point that Annie has gone back to this couple and said, "Thank you, mm-hmm. ministering to my mom and dad," yeah. because it trickled down to them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 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 Oh, Joe. Um, well, so, well, we had a very special meal. Yeah. Last Sunday. Saturday. Was Saturday? Mm-hmm. Saturday? If you're thinking of the same one I am, you missed. Yeah. Came yeah. Over. yeah. And and his birthday, this big white van came over. Mm-hmm. Did everybody in it? Oh. Food and all. Mm-hmm. And yeah, Chris is good for that. And that was that was really special. Mm-hmm. And Daniel stood five minutes before. You better get dressed. There's somebody coming. It's <laughs> <laughs> a subtle surprise. <laughs> and this is like four o'clock in the afternoon. Well, you, know? you were not dressed. <laughs> <laughs> you want to stay in your pajamas? <laughs> Why not? Working at home. Yeah. yeah. He had just gotten back from India the day before, and so he was. Oh, you were still time. Oh, he was. He was in between naps. Yeah. We had a great time. Yeah, it was. It was really. Neat. Um, one of the most memorable birthdays mom's ever had, I think, at least the, the ones that I remember. Um, I just want to hit on this briefly as well before we conclude here. 
the another issue to think through as we're thinking through how to apply this today. There are churches in the world today that suffer physically far more than we do. You know, just think about North Korea or Sudan or Eritrea or Syria right now. The Christians there are suffering physically. I mean, very seriously, even more seriously than what, what's going on in Isaiah's day. <clears throat> Torture, starvation, imprisonment, um, denial of medical care. And there are churches in the world today with far greater spiritual needs than ours as well. Um, people, churches around the world are in great need of, of theological training. Some of them need Bible training. They just don't have Bible. They need pastors to be disciples and trained in um, there's great need for, for spiritual <coughs> food and discipleship in China and India and Pakistan and Iran and places like that. So, in light of this passage, what should we do, do you think? Is this passage calling us to meet needs in our own church because they're local or to meet global needs because they're more serious? What do you think? Is this passage calling us to meet <coughs> needs in our own church because they're local, so we can be personally involved in easily, or is it calling us to meet global needs for the churches uh, around the world because their needs are more serious? Both. Both. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. The, this isn't an either or. We can't ignore either aspect. Paul's letters to the churches encourage um, meeting needs locally in their own church and meeting needs long distance, in their case, the church in Jerusalem that was suffering at the same time. It wasn't just saying, you know, do one and then the other, or do one or the other. It was do both, meet local needs and meet the long distance needs. <clears throat> if we neglect those with the great needs around the world, we become more introverted and self-centered. But if we neglect the local needs, we'll become just kind of impersonal, send a check, fix them kind of thing, and just be more um, physical need oriented and <clears throat> ignoring their real need. <clears throat> Maybe the best way for us to meet both needs is for some of us to go as missionaries, at least to go around and encourage them in person, not just pay somebody else. Then if we can. What's if, that? If God's saying you. Yeah, yeah, but you said to go. I know it's for everybody, so yeah. it's just a matter of who you're supposed to go to. So. There's, there's a question that I always ask. Say, go. Does it mean everybody? Mm -hmm. That Jennifer says that every Christian should go and be a missionary somewhere. Every Christian. Okay. Now that she's done it, she can say that. Yeah. She didn't want to go until she, she went. She went to Cal uh, She went to Turkey. She went to Mexico twice. Oh, good. Yeah. But what the CT study said something. But like she said, "Just don't send me to Africa, Lord." <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a dangerous prayer. She doesn't <laughs> want to go to Africa. <laughs> um, so, but what the CT study said, said something like, uh, "Some want to live within the sound of church and bell." I want to build a rescue shop within the yard of hell, something like that. Um, if we want to experience these promises to the full extent, perhaps um, we need to jump into the middle of things. But the challenge I want to leave you with, though, is if you want to experience these promises, just go find out the needs of your brothers and sisters and do something to help. Don't hide yourself from your own flesh. It's so easy. I mean, I think if you can just get the church directory, look through there and say, what is the need of this person? And if you don't know the need, it's probably not because they don't have any needs. It's probably just because you don't know them very well yet. And try to get to know them. Spend some time. Have them over for a meal or whatever and, and start there. Um, let's see if any of these would be... Nope. Okay. Any questions or comments before we close? Julie's going to go visit Jennifer. <laughs> All right. Okay. Ah, are you going to send it? Are you going to give me the money? <laughs> <laughs> I can write, write the check, right? <laughs> uh -oh. I don't have the money. Uh, <laughs> but you got a rich father. Oh, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh -oh. I can ask him. If he can feed a fasting, fasting cattle on the heels. <laughs> cattle on a thousand hills. Oh, uh, let's see. Um... I just want to make sure that I left you with the main point of this. I just feel like I've wow. hit on so many points. I guess.
to, to summarize it, it. To try to summarize it. If we, as we pour out, as we pour out ourselves for the needs of our brothers and sisters in Christ, God will refill, refresh, and renew us. Don't wait for the refilling to come before you go meet needs. Amen. Just yeah. go out and look for needs and meet them, and don't worry about if it's a big one or a small one or a strategic one or an unstrategic one. Just go look for a need among a brother or sister and do something, and God will refill you. With not, joy, with who? Not because this is going to earn you anything from God, but because this will help you enjoy God more. Um, That's good. Anything, uh, Randy, that you can think of that I should straighten out there? <laughs> okay. Um, maybe can you close? Sure. Thanks.